All right, so we're looking at federalism and the idea of federal grants and mandates. So first of all, let's just rewind and look at the difference between a federal government and a unitary government. Federal government is like what we have in which you have local governments which can make final decisions. So if there is something in their purview, they can do that. For example, you may have heard about like school board um, votes, etc. cetera, um, like a budget vote. Those are things that a locality can actually decide for themselves. And that happens in the United States, Canada, Australia, Germany, and a lot of other countries. That's different than a unitary government, which do have local governments, but usually they can't, they're not independent and can't make final decisions. So if you look at like France and, and Great Britain, Sweden, Italy, those are examples of unitary systems. So just keep in your mind what a federal government is. So one of the problems with federalism is there is no clear delineation between the levels of government. There can be both confusion and controversy about which level is going to be responsible for which functions. Um, oftentimes that confusion really comes to the forefront if there is a crisis. Um, a case in point of, of looking at this federalism confusion during a crisis period would be Hurricane Katrina. So we saw during Hurricane Katrina that the federal, state, and local governments all were fighting over who was supposed to maintain the levees, who should lead the disaster relief, who should get the buses, all of those things. And really it was weeks after the hurricane that it came out to the, the public that most of the first responders were actually from religious and charitable organizations, not the government. Um, and FEMA, which is the, the emergency management okay, at the federal level, oftentimes it was actually making it harder for volunteers, not easier. And we're going to look at, at that uh, later. Class um, watched a video. If you are not here, you are going to have to catch up on that. So when we look at the pros of federalism, we have um, the idea that it gives you flexibility, all right? It protects individual liberties. If we look at the change that we have seen for African Americans, Hispanics, women's, and other groups um, to win legislative seats, okay, um, within their own state, when we didn't see that in the U.S. Senator House, that wouldn't happen without federalism, all right? We see that oftentimes some states and cities have taken the lead far, far ahead of the federal government to develop measures for the, for, uh, the environment. Think about California and the emissions that they have for the automobiles. Civil rights. We had states that were enacting laws much, much before the federal government, improving social conditions. Again, so that's some of the pros. The cons are that states can actually block action. Uh, they can prevent progress and upset the federal plans. Um, they can see through like a smaller lens and therefore they're often protecting local interests and can, can cater to either self-interest um, of the politicians or of the constituents rather than the whole of the United States. State and local governments um, have in the past legalized and protected racial discrimination when the federal government was trying to dismantle that. Um, anytime, all right, you've got some people in some places are going to make bad choices and some are going to make good. We see an increase in political activity, okay? The federal government mobilizes political activity, and people are more likely to become involved in activity when he or she feels there is a reasonable chance of producing a practical effect. So <clears throat> while we may see an issue going on in the federal government, I may not go march on Washington, but I might take an action here in my local government, which is going to make me feel like I have a better chance of producing a practical effect. So when we look at what the states do, uh, oftentimes states' constitutions are, are more detailed and there are more rights listed than in the federal constitution. Um, 
many states, not including here in New York, uh, have more options for direct democracy, like an initiative, a referendum, and recall. Uh, those primarily are out west. Okay. When we look at the states versus the city, states are guaranteed existence by the federal government. You can't have a state to be divided without federal consent. So I know there was like a push uh, this summer to see California split. That can't happen without the federal government consenting to that. Each state has to have two senators. Okay, that's the only part of the Constitution that we can't amend. Okay, that's in there. It can't be changed. Every state is going to be assured of a Republican form of government, and the powers that aren't granted to Congress are granted to the states. Okay. We also know that cities and towns and counties don't have those protections, and they exist at the pleasures of the states, and there's no debate. Uh, the division of the power is settled. The state is supreme over the town. All right, so we're going to look at how the states get money to do things. All right, so when we look at the first one, it's going to be grants and aid. And that uh, these are going to be the first... The first type of these were land grants. Uh, these were specifically to finance education. So if you remember learning your U.S. history, those land grants to the states in order to finance education, this is your first. We have the cash grants, which started in 1808, which were to pay the militia. And again, the states were in charge of the size and the scope of the militia. Up until recently, they, you didn't see strings attached to the grants and aid. All right. And they really started to grow, um, especially in the 1880s, 1890s, okay, up until the 1920s. These cash grants just kept growing and growing and growing. Um, the money was there because we'd had the high tariffs in the 1880s. Um, and then the 1920s, the, the surplus of all of that money was dwindling. And then we had the 16th Amendment, and we've got income tax passed. So the federal government managed the money. Um, they can also print it at will, which can lead to inflation and other things, but we'll talk about that later. Uh, but the big piece of this was, was politics, because the federal government, the money seemed to be free to the state leaders, right? There was no responsibility for taxing. So you're getting this money, and you're able to do the stuff that you want to do. Uh, and that federal money really was seemed like no strings attached because you weren't the one responsible for taxing the people to get it. At the same time, you can say, oh, the federal government is terrible. They're taxing too much and they do all of these things. They're spending too much money. And yet at the same time, you can take credit for all the new projects that you're able to, to do in your state with the money that you've received from the federal government. The issue becomes that as it has grown and grown and grown and grown, every state wants money. And if one gets it, all right, then many are going to get it. And it really turns into this idea of the pork barrel politics. All right. So when we look at the national needs, all right, it was really up until the 1960s that most of the federal grants and aid were either conceived by or in cooperation with the states, and they were designed to serve a specific purpose of the states. During the 1960s, it really starts to change, and we see this shift being away from that cooperation with the states and figuring what the states want to more being about what the federal government deciding what they saw the national need was and then to push forward that agenda within the states. All right, again, think LBJ, great society. So when we reached 2006, the federal aid was really 30% of the state's general revenues. That means 30% of the money that's coming into the state for them to spend was coming from the federal government. All right. That's a huge portion. We also had Medicaid. So Medicaid is looking at 40% of all the federal grants. And if you look at like compared to transportation, that's about 10%. So again, that's what these, these monies are going towards. So 
we have what we call are called the intergovernmental lobby. So you've got state and local officials, both elected and appointed, who basically became highly dependent upon these federal funds. They get money and then they're able to do projects, which helps them to get reelected or makes them look good so that they can get appointed. Um, if you look at mayors, governors, superintendents, all of these are going to be these officials that we're talking about. So the federal agencies basically have to staff and inform and assist these local organizations. And the national organizations of governors want more money. Okay, They want money without naming particular cities. And the idea of this is trying to get more money with fewer strings. Okay, Because as the receiver of money, you want to be able to do whatever you want what you see as the best use of that money you want to be able to do. Think about the federal government. The federal government wants to put more strings on it to make sure that that money is being used to serve a purpose that the government, the federal government, sees as the best way to use that money. And that's where that tension comes in. So we have categorical grants. Categorical grants um, are designed by the federal law all right, and they serve a specific purpose. An example for this would be to build a, to build an airport or welfare payments, and they require the state or locality to match some of the funds in order to receive the money. This does not make state and local officials happy because it can be hard to adapt the grant to the local need. So, for example, um, if it's for an airport, you may have to bulldoze a bunch of houses in order to build the airport where the federal government wants you to put it. That might not be popular um, in your locality, and it might get you unelected. Um, you know, you're not going to get reelected on on that platform, and so it can make for tension. So the response to this was to consolidate a lot of these categorical grants into a block grant. And the purpose of a block grant was to have fewer restrictions. And these start in the 60s. And the idea was that it was supposed to give more freedom to the local government. Uh, the problem became that the amount of money that was available became smaller because the federal government's putting more and more money into the categorical grants because, again, you're the federal government, you want more strings, not less. Um, and so the federal government wants to see those restrictions increase. And so you're going to see these, these political coalitions that are going to grow. And when you've got all of this division, no single group has a vital stake in pressing for the enlargement, and so it's not going to function well. Now, if you were not in class, you missed the beginning of the video on federalism through the eyes of Hurricane Katrina. Uh, as a result, you'll need to get that link, which is on Classroom, and start watching it. And we will see you in class next time.